Hi, welcome. My name is Andrew. I'm one of the pastors at Epping Baptist Church. I'm really glad you could join us today. Last week, the pastors got together and we had one of our regular Bible studies. And in it, we uh, looked at a passage from Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 14. We're using a book by Timothy Keller and his wife as our study guide. Proverbs 18, verse 14 says, The human spirit can endure in sickness, but a crushed spirit who can bear? Many of us are physically okay, and yet many are also struggling as well in our spiritual lives. Timothy Keller goes on to say, what is the implication of this passage today? There's nothing more important than maintaining your inward spiritual life. A broken body can be sustained with difficulty by a strong spirit, but a broken spirit cannot be sustained by even the physically strongest person in the world. We're often taught that our happiness is based on external things such as beauty, health, money and status. The psalmist knows something of this and he encourages us to walk with God. Psalm 84 says, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord, and my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young. A place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, for they are ever praising you. As we reflect, as we think, as we prepare to meet together in different places this morning, or indeed this evening, we come and focus our thoughts and our minds and our lives on Christ Jesus. Today we're thinking about Pentecost and Nathan will be talking about Pentecost from Acts chapter 2 a little later on in our service. A chance to remember that God is in control and that his spirit works through people even today. So whatever we're facing, whether we're physically strong or not, whether we're finding it difficult mentally to hold things together or whether we're struggling in some other way, today, take heart that as we walk with God, he walks with us. May you be encouraged as you reflect, as you think, and as you join us through this service. May God bless you today. And I hope that you'll be able to come on uh, between 10.30 and 11.30 and enjoy fellowship on our Zoom meeting. May God bless you as we open up in worship today. Thanks for joining us. God bless. Hey everyone, we're going to sing Jesus Strong and Kind this morning if you'd like to join in with us. We really love this song because in all this craziness uh, we can always run to Jesus and this song reminds us of that. I'm going to do some actions if you'd like to join along at home, that would be awesome too.
kids, welcome to church. It's so good to have you here this morning. If you want to click on the links below, there's heaps of resources for you. But today we're talking about the Pentecost. And the Pentecost is a crazy day because it's where Jesus now doesn't live on earth, but he lives in heaven. And so now he gives us his Holy Spirit to live inside of us. And so God is with us every single day because he's living with us. And something really cool that I find about the Pentecost and the fact that God has given me his Holy Spirit to live with me means that I'm never ever alone. And at the moment when I feel a little bit sad that I can't see my friends or I can't see any of you at Sunday school, God can still remind me heaps of cool things to be thankful about. I know what the number one thing that he's been teaching me to be thankful about about church is that I can wear my pajamas. <laughs> As part of our service each week, we like to include a section that's called offering. Offering is an opportunity to present our gifts, our tithes to God for his work at Epping Baptist and beyond. I don't know if you remember, but on the 15th of March was the last time we met in the building. And we focused on a particular subject. I wonder what that was. Let me think. Do you know? Call out your answers if you remember. Oh, sorry, hang on. Just put in my earpiece so I can hear you. Oh, that's right. Yes, we talked about giving, didn't we? And we talked particularly about Thanksgiving. We focused on the gifts that God has given us, the generous gifts, amazing gifts that God's given us. And a couple of weeks ago, we focused on the greatest gift of all, Jesus Christ, who was given for each one of us so we can have life in him. So today we have this opportunity to give thanks to God, to recognize all he's given us and to respond as an act of being a disciple. Would you join with me in prayer? Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for our service so far and the opportunity to meet together as a church family. Lord, in this time of our service, as we focus upon our gifts and our offerings, we thank you. Thank you for Jesus, the best gift of all. Thank you for your generosity in giving us so much. And our gifts, I guess, are many, in many ways are a small token, but it is an act of discipleship. As we recognize you are a God of love, a God of care and a God of generosity. We give thanks in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's pray together. Almighty God and loving Father, we adore you. Thank you for loving us. We thank you for all the blessings and grace you have so generously given to us. We offer you our praise as we meet today. We offer our hearts to you. Christ Jesus, we thank you for washing away our sins and giving us the gift of eternal life. Thank you for showing us how to live. Be with us and help us to live in a way that pleases you. Holy Spirit, lead us to the right path. And if on our way we encounter difficulties and trials, do not allow us to fall or lose hope. Grant us the grace and comfort we need each day. Loving God, we ask that you will be with us today as we listen to the message and share in this experience of church being apart, but still worshipping together. We ask that our hearts and minds will be open to you as we listen. We pray for each other uh, in different circumstances as we are isolated. Please be with families who are at home together. Please help each home to be peaceful and harmonious. Please be with those who live alone. 
May they feel your presence with them at this time. Please be with those who have concerns about employment, finances, health and safety. Thank you for being with us in all circumstances. Thank you that we can cast our anxieties onto you. Thank you for the hope you have given us. Amen. Amen. Today's Bible reading comes from the New Testament book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. I can't tell you what page that is in your Bible, nor can you follow on the screen. So I hope you have your Bibles handy and you can now turn to Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They have had too much wine. Acts chapter 2 verse 1 begins with a simple phrase, When the day of Pentecost came. Now what Luke does here is, is two things. He, he's just putting these events on the time-spacing continuum. They, they happened in history on a particular day on the calendar. But the second thing he does is place these events in the context of a Jewish agricultural religious festival, a really important one. It was this festival where, where God's people celebrated his grace, his provision and generosity. It's mentioned a whole bunch of times in the Old Testament, but probably the best of those is in Deuteronomy chapter 16. He says, then celebrate the festival of weeks to the Lord your God by giving a free will offering in proportion to the blessings the Lord your God has given you. And rejoice before the Lord your God at the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name. You, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, the Levites in your towns and the foreigners, the fatherless and the widows living among you. Remember that you are slaves in Egypt and follow carefully these decrees. In time, Pentecost became more than just an agricultural festival because 50 days after Passover, the people of Israel actually arrived at the base of Mount Sinai where they were given the law or the Torah, or effectively a whole new way of life to live as freed slaves. Like they were given this way of life to live before the nations that would show the world the wisdom of God. So Pentecost was this day where they celebrated God's grace, his provision and generosity and a whole new way of life. But with that was an element of sadness that although they received all of these things from God, they would never really lived up to their calling. And even their ancient prophets talked about this longing that they would actually live up to the ideals that the Torah called them to. So in Ezekiel chapter 36, it actually talks about this longing. So Ezekiel 36, 
Uh, verse 25 says this, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I, I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and will move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land that I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. So they celebrated God's provision, his generosity, his grace, the giving of a whole new way of life. But at the same time they acknowledged more, there was this longing that they would finally be the people that God had called them to be, that he would actually give them his spirit and a new heart and change their very lives. They long for that. I wonder if I long for that. I wonder if you long for that. So on the day of Pentecost, on this really special day, all the believers are gathered together in one place, the scripture tells us. And just before we jump into what happens next, it's, it's good to think for a moment on this whole phenomenon in the Bible called theophany. Now it's an impressive word to wheel out at a, at a Bible study, but it, it just means where God manifests himself or makes himself known to a human being in a really dramatic and observable way. So theophany in the Old Testament scriptures, God revealing himself, usually happened in three ways. Often there was wind, often there was fire, and then there was inspired speech from God himself. So keep that in mind as we read what happens next. So I'm reading from verse 2. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. So they're sitting in this upper room praying and they have this extraordinary um, experience where there's a sound like a violent wind or blowing wind. They're reaching for metaphor. They're having this extraordinary experience and I don't know how to put in the words. So they said it's like a blowing wind. And that's really significant because like I said before, it's a theophany word. The word wind in Hebrew comes from ruach, which can mean breath, wind or spirit. And it's the same for the Greek word pneuma. It can mean breath, wind, or spirit. So just when you say the word wind, it's freighted with all these Old Testament links. So in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, God breathes life into humanity when he creates them. So wind is associated with creation or breath or spirit. Then in Genesis, uh, after the flood, it's the wind that dries up the land or in the Exodus story, it's the wind that separates the water so that Israel can march right through. So spirit or wind or breath is connected with this whole idea of salvation and God's rescue. And then again and again in the, in the Old Testament are these stories where the spirit of the Lord or the ruach of the Lord or the breath of the Lord falls upon a judge or a prophet and they speak the word of God or they act in ways that, that bring God's uh, rescue to life. So here that same wind, that life-giving breath, this empowering spirit, this this extraordinary presence of God is falling on these early disciples. Then after wind comes fire, another image that soaked in Old Testament history. It says they saw what seemed to be like tongues of fire that separated and, and came to rest on each of them. So this fire from God or what seemed to be like fire came and rested upon them. Like I said, fire is steeped in Old Testament history. So the first occasion is in Exodus chapter 3 where the prophet Moses meets God in a bush that's burning yet it's not consuming the bush. That's at the base of a mountain called Mount Horeb. The next time we meet God as a fiery presence is, is in the desert. A pillar of fire guides the Israelites by night as they're fleeing the Egyptians. And then we get back to Mount Sinai in Exodus 19, where Sinai is also known as Mount Horeb, the very same place where Moses 
encountering the burning bush, but there God is a fiery presence in a mountain. And then God's presence comes down off the mountain and, and lives in the tabernacle so that God's dwelling place might be with his people. And then it moves into the temple, which is built by David, or sorry, Solomon in the Old Testament. And ultimately, it, it comes to a point in Israel's history where there's a prophet named John the Baptist who said, I've come to baptize with water, but there's one who's coming who will baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. Someone will come and give God's presence to his people. And that someone is Jesus. So we've had wind and we've had fire. Now we had that third form of theophany written in verse 4. It says, All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So they began to speak the very words of God. Now what's really interesting here is verse 5 tells us that because uh, Pentecost was this great pilgrimage festival, everyone, Jews from all around the world, had gathered in Jerusalem, uh, who spoke all kinds of different languages, who were from all different cultural backgrounds. And what seems really clear about this occasion, I think it's different in Corinthians, is the tongues here are human languages, ordinary human languages. They were given this special ability to speak the languages of these guests from other parts of the world, and they proclaimed to them the praises of God. So when they spoke, these people heard and understood God being praised in their own language. And it says, when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their language being spoken. Now they were, in truth, unsure what to do with this phenomenon. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these people speaking Galileans? In other words, country bumpkins, maybe even bogans. Galileans were known for their thick accents and their country bumpkin ways. So they were kind of looked down upon. So there was this sense of disbelief that they were all multilingual, right? And some were so in a state of disbelief that they said this, um, that some of them, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much wine or literally uh, had too much sweet wine. So this, this phenomenon of the Spirit falling on God's people had occurred. Uh, wind, fire and inspired speech. And suddenly they were proclaiming the message of God's salvation to all people on earth. And funnily enough, this, this act of proclaiming the gospel to, to this group of people, these guys became the first fruits of a movement of followers of Jesus. Like many thousands, in fact, will come to faith in Acts chapter 2. And it's like that offering at Pentecost, that first bit of the wheat harvest, was given to celebrate God's provision and abundance here. As God gives his spirit to his people, they begin to work and they see the first fruits of this, this harvest. See what God's Holy Spirit can do. It's, it's remarkable. God can give us his companionship, his presence with us, but also his power. So what should we expect, you know, when it comes to the Holy Spirit? Um, I believe that this is kind of a unique event in salvation history. Like, this was a moment where not every believer had the Spirit, and now every believer would get given the gift of the Spirit. Uh, I reckon there's many Pentecost moments in Acts chapter 8 where the Samaritans have kind of a Pentecost, where the Spirit marks them out as truly belonging to the people of God, which is so surprising to Jews. And then another one in Acts chapter 10, where the Gentiles receive the Spirit of God and are marked out as God's people. And they have this amazing experience in the sight of the apostles so that they get to that even the Gentiles can belong to the people of God. So it becomes clear as you read on through the epistles that God gives you his spirit when you first become a Christian. You read in Ephesians uh, chapter 1 verse 13, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believe, you are marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the place, to the praise of his glory. See, when you understand the gospel for yourself, 
the Spirit has helped you do that. So sometimes the Spirit slips into someone's life and it's like fire and wind and explosive. But in other times, it's like a quiet whisper, a, a quiet visitor has slipped into your life and began to turn it upside down gradually, quietly, uh, slowly. But there's no doubt God is with you in this life. See, that's the promise that you receive the Spirit when you become a Christian. But there's no doubt that the Bible encourages us to long for more of the Spirit's feeling, to be to be filled with his presence, to be empowered afresh, to be renewed, uh, to keep growing, to keep hungering and being filled with God so that we would have a sense of companionship and empowerment. So you get these commands in the epistles like this. So this is Ephesians 5.18, which says, Do not get drunk on wine. Wine, which is an invisible influence, because it leads to debauchery, like it leads to bad stuff, drunkenness. Instead, he says, be filled with this spirit in a continual way, Paul means. Be refreshed, be renewed, keep seeking that infilling of the Holy Spirit. And then we get told in in Luke's gospel of Jesus telling us to pray for the spirit as if it's the greatest thing that we can possibly have. He says in Luke chapter 11 verses uh, 11, he says, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will, you, will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? See, he, Jesus is saying, the best thing I can give you is, is the Holy Spirit because that's the way God is with us. See, all of our salvation comes from the Father through the work of the Son and it's applied to our heart and our experience by the presence and work of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy, Holy Spirit who unlocks all of the Christian life and empowers us and gives us a sense of companionship. So I wonder if you could pray and ask, ask God to fill you afresh. It seems like we're sailors in this life. Like a, a sailor's job is not to come up with his own power, but he still has to, or she still has to hoist their sail to catch the wind. You know, they just don't stand there doing nothing. They actually do the hard work of hoisting up their sail so it's ready for when the wind blows. And it seems like the way we hoist the sail, according to the New Testament, the way we be filled with the Spirit is simply to ask God. You know, we're asking for a gift. It's not something we earned. But I wonder if you could pray, take this time of isolation to seek God and just ask him to do a fresh thing in your life, to fill you afresh with his companionship and his empowerment. Forgiveness was 
morning we've loved having you we love to hear from you guys so please make sure that you send us something let us know that you've been here kids we want to see what you've been doing send us your crafts activities send us a picture we'd love to see them why don't you join with me as we pray heavenly father we thank you that despite our circumstances and situations we are still able to gather together as your people Although it looks very different, we thank you that we're able to sing together, hear from your word together, and pray together. God, we thank you for the words that Nathan has spoken this morning, and we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit to guide us, to help us, to help us be in tune with you. God, we pray as we look towards the week ahead that we may draw closer to you, that we may pull into you, and that we may know your peace, your presence, and your love. God, we thank you that we know that you are at work in all things, and we pray that in all things your name may be known. We pray this in your son's almighty name. Amen. We'll see you guys soon. Bye! <laughs>